and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. You ever have uh, those friends that don't kill bugs? You ever had those? My friends that don't kill a bug, you know. Um, I am not one of those people. If a bug wants to commit suicide, it needs to be walking around in my presence, right? Well, I was at the gym the other day and saw this spider wanted to challenge me. So it was walking around on the floor, and I was about to smash it with my foot. And a friend of mine stopped me and said, no, take it out. I'm like, what? No, take it out. I said, all right. So I took the spider. We went out to dinner. She was pretty nice. She was a graduate of Gardner-Webb University. She majored in uh, web development. She was friendly. She was smart. One thing was a big turnoff, though. She had a lot of kids. <laughs> I just wasn't putting up with that. Anyway, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. A couple weeks ago, uh, we did a message called Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And we discussed the definition of waiting on the Lord. And we learned that the word wait here, um, used in this verse, can also be translated to hope and to trust. To hope and trust in the Lord. All three of those definitions are what is meant by the Hebrew word wait. To, to wait, to hope, and to trust. And so if we are to fully trust in the Lord, we also need to wait on Him and have hope in Him. We also learn that God is worthy of waiting on. He is worthy of waiting on. He is great. He is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Right? By His hands we all are fed. Give us the Lord our daily bread. But he is also incomparable. There's nothing that can compare to him. There's no I don't know other God. Nothing can compare to the Almighty God. And I told you this story, and I'm not going to retell the story. If you have the opportunity, you can go back and look at it on YouTube or Facebook. But I told you a story of a father taking a young son on a hiking trip. And the moral of the story was, if we're to truly wait on God, if we truly wait on God, he protects us. He guides us. He comforts us. He lifts us up in times of trouble. He provides for us. He brings us to new heights. And He blesses us beyond belief. Now, it's not easy to wait on God. Nothing about it's easy. But today we're going to happen or look at, see what happens when we wait on God. The results of waiting on God. So if you would stand with me as we read scripture today, Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to start in verse 27 to kind of get a bigger context of what's going on in the primary verse, verse 31. Isaiah says this, Why do you complain, Jacob? Now Jacob is another name for Israel, but used synonymously all throughout scripture. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary or tired. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who trust or hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Fathers, we come before you now. You speak to us clearly the message you have prepared. This is not about what I think is important. It's not about what I think needs to be said. Lord, this is about you and what you want said. So I pray that you would use me as your vocal cords, your mouthpiece this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So let's look at briefly the results of waiting on the Lord. The result, the first result here is renewed strength. Renewed strength. Look at it. Look at it. It says, they shall renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, what does that mean? You know, strength is very important to me. I'm a strength trainer. I do a lot of strength training personally. I do a lot of strength training with clients and those kind of things. Um, so it speaks very clearly to me. What is strength? And it's a very logical thing. Strength comes in the waiting process. 
Now, to me, as a trainer, that does not compute. Okay? <laughs> strength and weighting, that doesn't make any sense. You know, strength is by lifting heavy things. That's where strength comes. But no, spiritually, strength comes when we wait on the Lord. And this is a very logical reason for this. Why? Because God is our source of strength. And when we disconnect ourselves from the source of strength, we thus become weak. Makes pretty logical sense to me. Now, think about it like this. Use a cell phone. You got a cell phone? Cell phones are pretty popular these days. Now, a cell phone usually has a battery charge of about 24 hours or so. Well, what happens after that? If you don't plug it in, what happens to the battery? Your phone dies. It's a useless phone at that point. But if it's connected to the power source, let's say you never, connect, never disconnected it from the power source. Would it ever die? Well, technically, in our world, it could die, just malfunction in some kind of way. But the battery shouldn't die if it's connected to the power source. The only time that phone would die is if the power source itself would lose power. So, in the similar way, when we connect ourselves to God, He is the ultimate power source. He never grows weary. He never grows tired. He never runs out of energy. He never has a power surge. Okay, He is the ultimate power source, and He never grows weak. And if we're connected to Him, guess what? By default, we also never grow weak and tired. But we do so by waiting on Him. Remember, waiting, hoping, and trusting in Him. That's how we stay connected to God. He is our power source. But maybe you're waiting on God in some area of your life. Anybody waiting on God in some area of your life? Am I the only one? Okay, we've got a couple people. Just waiting on God to do something in some, in some part of your life. Well, let me, let me encourage you with this. Sometimes we experience delays. Waiting often involves delays. But here's some encouragement I've found in studying this message. Number one, perhaps God's delays in your life are to strengthen you. Perhaps God's delays in your life are to strengthen you. I heard a preacher say one time, when you pray and ask God for something, you get, may get one of three answers. Yes, no, or wait. Yes, no, or wait. And just as many have said before, God's delays are not always God's denials. Just because God is delaying and giving you an answer or the answer is wait does not mean no. It may be not yet. So hope in Him. And the more we depend on Him in times of waiting, the stronger we become. Even when we feel weak and broken, like we're on the verge of collapse, God will lift us up and give us new strength. Just like the Father did in the story I told. When the Son was getting weak and going up this hill and he was tired and running out of energy, he's, the Father threw Him on His back and they kept going. When we are weak and we are burdened down, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He will lift us up, but we have to trust Him. And that's an active trust. It's not a passive trust, it's an active trust. We have to actively trust in Him, because passively, we do not passively trust, because passive trust means that, and left to our default mechanisms, we don't naturally trust God. And left to our default mechanisms, I hope you understand what I'm saying, we do not naturally trust God. It is an active thing that we must intently do. And it takes good effort to do it. But maybe the strength, maybe God needs us, needs to prepare us to get us stronger for something that's coming ahead. If you really got what you're waiting on right now, God only knows if you're really prepared for it. God only knows if you're strong enough to handle it. God only knows if you are in the right place, in the right frame of mind, in the right spiritual condition to handle it. And so God's delays for you receiving what you're waiting on may be because you're not prepared yet. He may need to strengthen you. Just like an athlete goes through many years of training to eventually compete at a high level of the Olympics or the World Cup. So are we being prepared in this waiting process, going through the training, the tough parts, before God eventually says, all right, it's time. 
He wants to prepare us. Think about Abraham. Abraham got a message when he was about 75 years old. God came to him and said, you're going to be the father of many nations. Of course, Abraham was like, okay, I don't even have a kid. At 75, he didn't have a son. He's like, well, how is this going to happen? The Lord said, I'm going to provide for you a son. You're going to have a son through, through your wife, Sarah. And then from him, you will have many descendants. You know how long it was between when God promised he would have a son and then when he actually had a son? About 25 years of waiting. He was about 100 years old when he had his first son. Well, it was actually his second son. The first one was Ill, illegitimate, we'll say. But the, the promised son was 25 years in waiting. Why wait 25 years? I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, it took 25 years at least to prepare Abraham to be the father he needed to be. It took 25 years to prepare Sarah for the wife she needed to be and the mother she needed to be. It took 25 years to prepare not just the people, but all the circumstances around it so that God will get the most glory out of the situation. Perhaps God needs to strengthen us with these delays. Number two, perhaps God's delays are to protect you. Are to protect you. Think about hindsight. You know, hindsight is often 2020, right? Often 2020. I can see clearly now that the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. But when the storm is raging and the waters are coming, and you can hardly see what's in front of your face. But once you get on the other side of the storm, it's like, oh, I can see that. I can see better now. I have more clear vision now. Hindsight is often 2020. Well, just like the story, the father knew that a storm was coming, so they went into a cave and hid themselves to protect themselves from the storm. In the same way, God protects us to, pre to prevent us from getting into a storm that we're not prepared for. Or getting to a, into a storm that really is a necessary one. But if we were to go out on our own and go on our own path, guess where we're going to find ourselves? In a mixture of a storm that we were never intended to be in. And where's the Father? Of course, He's always with us. And He's like, I told you. Stay with me. And now we find ourselves in the midst of this storm. And it's going to be a hard road to get out of. So perhaps God's delays are to protect us. We wait on the Lord, and we will avoid regrettable decisions. But God may even lead us, just like in the story with the Father, He may even lead us into a pack of wolves. You think about the disciples, who they experienced much persecution along their journey. And God was leading them to do so. God's protection may not often be how we define protection. But he is surely to protect us. He never promises physical protection. The disciples were beaten, scourged, thrown off temple tops, skinned alive, burned at the stake, beheaded. He never promised physical protection. Jesus was crucified. Peter was crucified upside down. He never promised physical protection. But he promises this, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What man can do to the body... Is nothing because I got your soul. No one can take us from the Father's hand. He will protect us. But it's not just a physical protection. He can protect us mentally, protect our mental state. Of course, he, is, he assures protecting our spiritual state. We are secured in the palm of his hand, never, never to leave us, never, never to forsake us. Jesus even says, I've never lost any of those the Father has given me. So we are guaranteed that eternal salvation in Christ once we've accepted Him. But God may be protecting us. And I tell you, when we go outside of God's will, we try to follow our own plans. Yes, God can rearrange it and get the best out of the situation, but he's, He may want to protect us from our own stupid decisions. Anybody ever made a stupid decision before? That is me. All right. Everybody should be raising their hand. Okay? We've all made dumb decisions before, regrettable decisions before, 
and got ourselves into a lot of trouble, produced a storm around our lives that we, God prefer us not to have gone through, but he can still use it for our good and his glory. But if we had leaned in on him and we had pressed into him, stay connected to him to follow him, we may have been protected from that storm. So God's delays may be to strengthen us and protect us. But number three, I think this was very important for us. God's delays may not be about you. God's delays may not be about you. Sometimes we can be very me-focused, very self-centered, focused on me, me, me. But what if God is delaying a situation, delaying working on a person or something around your life because to move you too early would impede his work in someone else's life. You ever thought about that? I had a preacher say one time, he used to do this all the time when he was, when he was preaching, I'm going to try it today. He would say, look at your neighbor and say, yada, yada, yada. So we're going to try this, okay? I'm going to repeat a phrase, you're going to look at your neighbor and say this phrase, all right? So look at your neighbor and say, I would do well to remember. Look at your neighbor and say, I would do well to remember that God is not just interested in me. All right, let's try it again. I would do well to remember that God is not just interested in me. You know why? Because He cares for everybody. He cares for all of us. He's got multiple children. You are not only, you're not the only child of God. You're not the only child that God cares about. He cares about all of us equally. He doesn't love you more than He loves somebody else. He loves us all, loves us, loves us all equally. But going back to the Abraham story, I told you it took 25 years for Abraham to receive his promised son. You know, what if Abraham was ready in 20 years, but Sarah wasn't? Maybe it took an extra five years to prepare Sarah than it did to prepare Abraham. God's delays may, have, may not have been about Abraham, it may have been about Sarah. Or it may have been about a situation that wasn't right. It may have been about a time. Fixing all the circumstances to make sure the timing was right. Maybe God's delays aren't really about us at all. One last observation about strength I'd like to note. And it's something I've said before, but it's good to recall some of these things. I'm prone to forget. Um, I'm sure all of us are, so it's good to have a little bit of rehearsal. But there are two types of strength here. Renewed strength. There's two types of strength. Strength as defined... Uh, by Webster's, is the ability to withstand or overcome an opposing force. To withstand or overcome. So there you have two distinct characteristics of strength. The first one is withstanding strength. And this kind of strength is foundation. Withstanding strength is foundational. It's like the integrity of a building. The building must be strong and steady and have a solid foundation to be prepared for earthquakes, to be prepared for storms and high winds. It's got to be strong and steady. Okay? It doesn't overcome the wind, doesn't overcome the, the earthquakes, but it's steady and strong within them. The second, uh, second type of strength is overcoming strength. And this kind of strength is functional. It's the ability to conquer or overcome, to overwhelm an opposing force. This is the one that's often highlighted above withstanding strength. We're not really impressed by the integrity of a building, but if we see a boxer lay out another boxer with a blow, we're like, man, that was awesome, you know? Or we see the Incredible Hulk flip a building on its end and throw it across the earth. That's pretty impressive, right? The overcoming strength is often more highlighted. It's, it's the, the poster children of, of strength. But you can't have overcoming strength unless you have a solid foundation. You cannot overcome the challenges of your life if you don't have the strength to withstand those challenges in the midst of. We all want to overcome the forces against us, but we 
cannot have overcoming strength without withstanding strength. We cannot overcome and claim victory without relying upon the right foundation. We can't overcome the situations in our life or the sin in our life without the ability to hold on to the truth while we're being battered by the waves. Sometimes we may have to have the strength and ability to withstand getting beat up by any opposing force before we can actually overcome it. Think about Jesus. He had the ability to overcome anything and everything. But while he was being beat and bruised and bleeding on that cross, it looked like he was losing the battle. That was his withstanding strength. Holding on to the forces. You know what he was holding back, though? Jesus could have easily at any point, while he was being beaten and bruised and bleeding out on that cross, at any point he could have said, God, I ain't doing this. And snap of his fingers, jumped down off that cross, killed everyone around him, and says, y'all people ain't worth it. He could have done that. Could have very easily done that. Had certainly had the power to do it. But he took a humble position. Because he knew he had to go through with it if he wanted to save us and to show us his love. That was his withstanding strength. But three days later, we see his overcoming strength. When he rose out of the grave and conquered death and conquered sin. His overcoming strength. But he could not have overcoming strength without first withstanding the forces that were against him. And sometimes I think the same is true with us. If we, ever, if we ever want to overcome the sin in our life, overcome the opposing forces against us, we've got to be able to withstand them first. Have the strength under pressure. We must stand on the right foundation. Our foundation is in Christ Jesus. He is our strength. He is our truth. No, not a person. We're not resting on a person. We're not resting on money. We're not resting on talents or skills or any family. We're resting in Jesus Christ. He is the source of our strength. So if you want to have a rock star faith, you need to have a rock star foundation. A foundation built on the rock of ages. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no, on, no, on other ground is sinking sand. You want to be stronger? Does anybody want to be stronger here today? Good. Wait on the Lord. There's your simple formula. You want to be wiser? Trust in Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, submit to Him. He will guide your paths. Psalm, or Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you want to experience joy, then rest and hope in Him. If you truly want a purposeful life, you must surrender to Him. That's where it boils down to. We have to surrender to doing His will and not our own. But not only do we have renewed strength as a result of waiting for the Lord, we also soar. We have soaring strength. We have soaring abilities. We soar on wings like eagles. The Lord brings us to new heights. He built beautiful sights and a change of perspective. You think about an eagle who is flying above the clouds. And looking upon the earth has a totally different perspective on the earth than we do on the ground looking up. When we follow after God and we're leaning on Him, He brings us to new heights to change our perspective of things, to give us His perspective of things. But also the imagery of the wings of eagles. You know, oftentimes when um, the eaglets are starting to learn how to fly, the mother eagle will put them under her wings. As she glides above the clouds. She's protecting them as she teaches them how to fly. That's the image of God with us. We soar with the Father as He guides us and protects us and teaches us how to fly. But it only happens when we wait on Him. You want soaring faith? We've got to wait on the Lord. And number three, enduring faith. Endurance. Strength, soaring, and endurance. 
You know, strength comes in two frames of reference. We have absolute strength, which is like this strength that comes in a moment of time. You think of a mother um, who sees a child trapped under a burning car. She, all of a sudden, he has this superhuman strength to lift this car up off this child, right? That's absolute strength. Well, there's another type of strength that's enduring strength. The ability to go on, to keep going. You think about running a marathon or a triathlon. It's the ability to go and to go and to go and not get weary. You don't get tired. You just move. That's the kind of strength that it takes to endure. Strength that lasts, that conquers long, grueling challenges. It gives us enduring strength. You know, I wish life were more like a sprint. It'd be a lot easier, but life is not a sprint. The Christian walk is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we have to continue on day after day, denying ourselves, day after day, taking up our cross, day after day, following Him. It's grueling sometimes. It's hard sometimes. But He promises us that He will strengthen us and give us the strength to endure these challenges that are ahead. Are you tired? Are you weary? Is life weighing heavy on you? Well, this should be really encouraging to you. Because as you wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength and give you strength to endure the challenges that you're facing. Because God will not grow weary, and He never grows tired. But waiting on the Lord is hard. It's slow, often painful process. But how are we supposed to wait? How do we hope? How do we, how do we truly trust? How do we wait on the Lord? I've got a couple things for us to think about. I think first, we wait patiently with great perseverance. The longer we wait, the greater the reward. The longer we wait, the greater the reward. The longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows. I'm sure you're familiar with that hymn. The longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows. We wait patiently with perseverance means that we don't try to jump ahead of God. We don't try to jump ahead of His plans. He's got it all planned out for us. And you want to make Him laugh, just try to tell Him your own plans. Right? You probably have heard that before. A signal of not waiting patiently is this. Whining and complaining. Whining and complaining. A signal of not being very patient and persevering in the trial and the waiting process. And that's what uh, the Israelites were doing. Verse 27 of our text today says, My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by God. In other words, they were saying, Lord, where are you? Lord, why are we going? I keep talking to you. It's like talking to a brick wall. Like, where are you, Lord? So they were whining and complaining. God don't even care about us. But He's an everlasting God. They were not real... They were not waiting very patiently. They were not waiting very persistently. They were too preoccupied with the waiting process and not enough with the working process. Because the best way that we can wait on the Lord is by working while we wait. We work while we wait. We work by trusting in His power. We trust in His plan. We trust in His sovereignty. And if we fully submit ourselves to trust Him, naturally, that would mean we obey Him. If we trust God and who He is and what He says, and He says for us to go and make disciples, well, then guess what we are supposed to do? We go and we make disciples. If He says we're to do this, we go do this. If he says we're going to do this, then we go do that. We work while we wait. Sometimes we get so preoccupied that we're waiting on something that we forget that we have a duty while we're still here. He's still got to use us in whatever capacity. We've still got work to do. Don't jump ahead of Him. When we try to jump ahead of Him, that's usually acting in our own self-interests, our own fears, or satisfy our own cravings. But we shouldn't forget that God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows how to give us lasting joy, lasting peace, lasting contentment. And He wants to fully satisfy us. And sometimes in order to get fully satisfied, it takes a little bit of waiting. 
for that process to fully develop. You know, for us to be really happy, to be content, there's two ways for God to do it. He can either just fulfill our desires that we currently have, or He can change our desires and then fill those. He's more interested in the latter part. Because He wants our desires to match His before He fulfills us. So if our desires don't match His, we shouldn't get upset that we don't have fulfillment. Because God needs to do a work in our heart first to give us lasting peace and lasting contentment so that we want what He wants from us. He's changing, He's in the heart changing business. He's been changing hearts since the beginning. He's going to continue to change our hearts. And I've been the product of that. He's changed my heart in a lot of ways. He's changed my desires in a lot of ways. Things I used to love, I don't like anymore. Things I used to hate, I'm starting to enjoy now. He changes hearts, if you let him. Now you can resist it, but it's a brutal process if you try to resist it. Submit to him. What we want now may not be what we want ten years from now, or five years from now, or even next week, because our desires go flippantly changing. So God wants our desires to match His because those are desires that are going to last eternity. And He wants to fulfill those permanently. But another thing, not only do we work while we wait, we worship while we wait. We worship while we wait. We were created to worship God. One of our primary reasons why we are here on this earth was to worship and have fellowship with God. But what is worship? It's an attitude. It's an act of adoration to God. And it has to do with an inward respect and adoration and an outward expression of praise. We often hear praise, a praise report. We give praise to the Lord through song. Well, praising is just an outward expression of worship. But worship is both inward and outward. And it, in fact, it should be inward then outward. Because God works in our hearts, and from the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks, and our body expresses. God wants to do the work in us, and we are created to worship Him. And as we work, and as we worship Him, that, that keeps us very well distracted in the fact that we're still waiting. If we're consuming ourselves with working and worshiping Him. When we start focusing on things that we currently do not have, that which we are currently waiting for, I know this from my experience, it tends to consume us when we preoccupy ourselves with what we don't already have, waiting on something that we want. It can be very consuming, distracting even. Satan can certainly use it to pull us away from God's will and dissatisfy us and leave us discontent and negative. But God wants to change us, to grab our attention and say, listen, I got you. I am really all that you need. If you can find satisfaction in your relationship with me, then you have everything that you need. Everything we need is bound up in Jesus Christ. We have need of nothing else. We have a lot of wants, but we are in need of nothing else. And God can fully satisfy us if we truly submit ourselves to Him. So as we come to a close this morning, let God sift your heart. Let God speak to you. What is He telling you? What is He convicting you of? How are you not waiting properly? Are you truly submitting to Him? Do you trust Him? Are you waiting on Him? Do you open Him? Be honest with yourself. Be open with yourself. Are you worried? Are you weary? Are you tired? Are you at the end of your rope? There is strength that can be found by waiting on the Lord. Remember, you're not waiting on a person. You're not waiting on a circumstance. You're waiting on the Lord. He will give you strength to withstand. He'll give you strength to overcome. He'll give you strength to endure. In Him and in Him alone, you will find the ability to soar on wings like eagles. You'll not grow weary. You'll not grow tired. You will not get faint. That's a promise. I hope you understand.
But all of this is very much dependent on establishing a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have no relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've never fully submitted yourself to Him, if you've never accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, if you've never believed on Him for salvation in your life, you're not going to have hope. You're not going to have trust. You're not going to have strength. You're going to be weary and you're going to be tired. Because you're trying to do life on your own. And God wants you to come to Him and let Him strengthen you. And it's done by first establishing that relationship with Him. By submitting yourselves to the cross. But even as believers in Christ, we can find ourselves wandering, trying to do life on our own. Today's challenge is as we get back in line with the Lord. We can find ourselves wandering over here, say, oh no. Just like a shepherd trying to gather his sheep and get them all going in the same path. That's what the Lord's doing with us. Sometimes we can wander. He's just trying to get us in the right path, get focused here. we still got work to do. Maybe you're in that area. You're just trying to wander over here a little bit, getting distracted. It's like, wait, we've we got, we got to focus in on working and worshiping the Lord. So you deal with the Lord how He's dealing with you today. You submit yourself to Him. Let's stand as we pray. Father, do thank you so much for meeting with us here. Thank you for your love. God, I pray that you would just bring conviction on us where we need it, Father, that uh, whatever's going on in our hearts and around our lives, Father, that we would just humbly submit ourselves to you. Wherever we are not walking in your path, God, you, you show that to us and help us to just be open and honest with ourselves and before you. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts, God, something new, something fresh. Encourage us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.